بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may his peace and blessings be upon his last and final messenger, his family, his companions and those who follow them until the end of times. So alhamdulillah, it truly is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's given all of us the ability, the opportunity to spend some time in the company of the Qur'an. To spend some time with the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trying our best to understand it, extract lessons, guidance, morals, and reminders. And most importantly, to implement those guidance and lessons and morals into our daily lives. As we know, the Qur'an is the last and final message sent for the guidance of humanity until the end of times. And it is the greatest miracle that was given to the Prophet ﷺ. And the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, it can be felt and experienced till this day. It is a book regarding which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَامِ In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's speaking directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And He tells him, This is a blessed book we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ so that people can think, reflect, and ponder upon its verses. And so that the people of intellect, the people of reason, can be reminded. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is telling us that there are two main objectives behind studying the Qur'an. At-tadabbur and at-tadakkur. At-tadabbur is deep reflection. Engaging with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Spiritually, emotionally, intellectually. At-tadhakkur is extracting reminders and lessons. And inshallah, these are the two objectives of today's seminar as well. We are going to approach Surah Yasin with the intention of At-tadabbur and At-tadhakkur. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also describes the Qur'an with one single adjective. He describes the Qur'an as being mubarak as being blessed. And the Qur'an is blessed in every single way possible. Everything about the Qur'an is blessed. It's full of blessings, it's a source of blessings. And part of the blessings of the Qur'an is anyone who learns it and teaches it is considered to be among the best of people. As the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The best among you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this small effort of ours to make us among the best of people. Now, before beginning our exploration of Surah Yasin, um, I would like to mention a few beneficial points that will help us approach the Qur'an as students, especially as seekers of guidance. That when we approach the Qur'an, when we study the Qur'an, we are supposed to approach it with a particular mindset, with a particular framework. And the most important component of that framework is recognizing that the Qur'an is a book of guidance. The primary objective of every single thing mentioned in the Qur'an is to guide us as human beings towards success in this life, but more importantly towards salvation in the life of the hereafter. And understanding the Qur'an as our own personal book of guidance makes it more relevant and real for us. So anytime I'm reciting the Qur'an, anytime I'm listening to the Qur'an, I should assume that this is my own personal book of guidance. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's speaking to me directly. And He's giving me this divine guidance. And He's teaching me how to live my life in a manner that is approved for by him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes the Qur'an as hudan lin nas. It is a guide for all of mankind. And that is something profound to reflect upon. The Qur'an is not only a book of guidance for us as believers, 
It is a book of guidance for all of humanity, regardless of their background, their ethnicity, their race and religion. The Qur'an contains guidance for every single human being. As long as they approach the Qur'an with an open heart, with an open mind, and with humility. But those who benefit most from the guidance are the people of taqwa. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also describes the Qur'an as hudan lil muttaqin. That the Qur'an is a guide for the people of taqwa. For those who are mindful, conscious, and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything that's mentioned in the Qur'an is mentioned with the objective of guidance. And when we recite the Qur'an, we should focus on the practical and spiritual points of guidance that we can extract and understand. Now, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions revelation, whenever He speaks about sending down the Qur'an upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He uses four divine attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of four of his divine attributes and names. Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, Al-Alim, and Al-Rahim. Al-Aziz, the Almighty, the All-Powerful. Al-Hakim, the All-Wise, the Most Wise. Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. And Al-Rahim, the Very Merciful. Now the word Al-Aziz, it's translated as the Almighty, the All-Powerful. It's describing the one who overpowers and cannot be overpowered. It conveys the meaning of power, strength, victory, honor, dignity, and highness. So whenever we're reciting the Qur'an, we should always keep in mind that these are the words of Al-Aziz. This is not the speech of a human being. This is the divine speech of Al-Aziz, the Almighty, the All-Powerful. That these words, they are a source of power, honor, strength, and dignity. And through these words, especially by acting upon them, we can acquire power, strength, victory, honor, dignity, and highness. And this is something that was highlighted by the Prophet ﷺ. He very beautifully said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْفَعُ بِهَادَ الْكِتَابِ أَقْوَامًا وَيَضَعُوا بِهِ آخَرِينَ Truly with this book, Allah elevates nations. And with it, He lowers others. The Prophet ﷺ, he's telling us any nation, any community that engages with the Qur'an, that reads it, recites it, memorizes it, preserves it, they understand the message, they implement it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises them. He gives them honor, dignity, strength, power, and influence. But as soon as the community abandons the Qur'an, as soon as the community puts the Qur'an to the side, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowers them. He humiliates them and He disgraces them. And according to a lot of our teachers and a lot of thinkers, this is the root cause for a lot of the problems we're experiencing globally as an ummah. That when we analyze the situation of the ummah globally today, we are not in the best of situations. We are experiencing several crises. And there's multiple factors that contribute to these crises but the main reason is abandoning the guidance of the quran that as a nation as a community we are no longer turning towards the quran for guidance we're looking somewhere else so whenever we recite the quran we should keep this in mind that these words are the words of al-aziz they are the words of the almighty the all-powerful the second attribute that Allah uses is Al-Hakim, the all-wise or the most wise, the absolutely and infinitely most wise. That there is some deep divine wisdom behind each and every single chapter, verse, and word of the Qur'an. Every single verse, ruling, command, prohibition, and story has some divine wisdom that we as human beings can sometimes understand and sometimes we can't. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a commandment, when He tells us to establish prayer, to pay zakah, to perform hajj, when He tells us to lower our gaze, when He tells us to stay away from riba, there's some deep divine wisdom there. So every single thing mentioned in the Qur'an is coming from Al-Hakim, the absolutely and infinitely most wise. 
And it's our responsibility as human beings to reflect upon that wisdom and try our best to understand it. The third attribute is Al-Alim, the all-knowing, the one whose knowledge is infinite, limitless, and never-ending. The one who knows every single thing, past, present, future, hidden and apparent, big and small. The one whose knowledge encompasses every single thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Al-Alim, He knows what's best for us as human beings. That oftentimes as human beings, we like to um, elevate our own status. We think very highly of ourselves. That we have these amazing faculties and abilities and capabilities. And we start assuming that we know what's best. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His knowledge is infinite, it is limitless, it is never ending. Whereas our knowledge is finite, it is limited. So whenever we recite the Qur'an, we're supposed to approach it with intellectual humility. That I am coming to Al-Alim. I am coming to the absolutely most knowledgeable to learn. Seeking guidance, seeking knowledge. The fourth attribute is Ar-Rahim. The most merciful. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolutely infinitely most merciful. And he tells us, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ That my divine mercy encompasses every single thing. And the nature of Allah's mercy is that it's vast, encompassing, limitless, endless, infinite, and it reaches all things. There isn't any Muslim or non-Muslim, obedient or disobedient individual who is not being constantly showered with Allah's mercy. And that is a profound reality for all of us to appreciate. That at every single moment of our lives, we are being showered with Allah's infinite, limitless mercy. And that these words we're reciting, they are an expression of Allah's infinite mercy as well. And these words of mercy were revealed to the heart of the Prophet of Mercy, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when reading and studying the Qur'an, it's important to keep these four divine attributes in mind. That helps give us, gives us a framework that the words we're reciting, the words we're studying and listening to, they are the words of Al Aziz, Al Hakim, Al Rahim, and Al Alim. So today we are going to try our best to explore uh, Surah Yasin. Time is a little bit limited, and we are going to try our best to get through the entire Surah, insha'Allah. Um, surah Yasin is the 36th chapter of the Qur'an. It's the 36th surah. And it's made up of 83 verses. And it's characterized by short verses in a fast rhythm, making it easy to recite and memorize. So even the way the verses are structured, even the words that are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are special, they are unique. And oftentimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives a particular flavor to different chapters of the Qur'an, making the message more effective. You know, oftentimes the way a message is delivered makes a very big difference. The tone of voice, the pace, the speed, the style, the language, the eloquence, all of these things make a difference. So when we come to Surah Yasin, we find that the verses are relatively shorter and that gives it somewhat of a faster rhythm. And that makes the message a lot more clear. It makes it more effective, more powerful. And it makes the surah easy to recite and memorize as well. And it's classified as a Meccan surah. Meaning it was revealed before the migration of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina. And some of the Mufassirun mention that it's the 41st surah to be revealed. So in terms of chronological order, it is the 41st chapter from the Qur'an to be revealed. It was revealed after Surah Al-Jinn and before Surah Al-Furqan. Now, when we analyze Meccan revelation, if we take all of the surahs that were revealed before migration, we will find that they share common themes. And the common themes of Meccan revelation, they revolve around faith and character. So every single verse, every single chapter of the Qur'an that's classified as being Makki, the two main themes are Iman, faith, and number two, akhlaq, character. 
And most Meccan revelation, when it comes to faith, it's focusing on three fundamental aspects of our system of belief. These would be the three most important aspects of our Iman. The first being Tawheed, belief in the existence, oneness, might, power, glory, and magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is the concept of Ar-Risana, prophethood and messengership. That throughout history, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected certain human beings to serve as his prophets and messengers, to propagate the truth to mankind. And number three is Qiyamah, day of judgment, life after death. The concepts of reward and punishment, judgment, accountability, paradise and hell. So Surah Yasin, just like all other Meccan revelation, it deals primarily with these three topics as well. So the three main topics, the three main subjects of Surah Yasin are Iman Billah, belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar-Risala, the idea of prophethood, and number three, Al-Qiyamah. And out of these three fundamental topics, the most emphasis is given to the concept of resurrection, as was recited by our beautiful Qari. Right, that page that he recited from Surah Yasin, those last two pages, a lot of it revolves around Al-Qiyamah, describing paradise and some of the pleasures people will enjoy, describing hellfire and some of the punishments people are going to experience. Now, one of the reasons for choosing Surah Yasin is that there are several narrations from the Prophet Wasallam that speak about the virtues, the rewards and blessings associated with this particular surah. So for example, Anas radiallahu anhi narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, Indeed, everything has a heart. Indeed, everything has a heart. And the heart of the Qur'an is Yasin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will record the recitation of 10 Qur'ans for whoever recites Yasin. So from this hadith, we learn about two distinct virtues associated with this particular chapter from the Qur'an. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ, he describes it as the heart of the Qur'an. Qalbu al-Qur'an. Right, the heart, the essence, the core of the Qur'an. And secondly, reciting the surah carries a lot of reward. Now, one of the reasons why it's been called Qalbu al-Qur'an one of the reasons why it's called the heart of the Qur'an is because of its eloquence, beauty, clarity, and emotiveness. That usually when speech is beautiful, when speech is eloquent, it penetrates the heart and we feel certain emotions. That if someone has a very beautiful voice and they are reciting perhaps some very powerful verses of poetry, if we're listening attentively, we're paying close attention, those words will penetrate our hearts and they will pull on our emotional strings and we'll feel a range of emotions. The same exact thing happens with Surah Yasin. If we recite it with focus, with concentration, with understanding, if we're paying close attention to the message, it will penetrate the depths of our hearts and it will pull on our emotional strings and we will feel the stronger connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as we know, the heart is the most important organ in the physical body. Similarly, the spiritual heart is the most important part of our soul. It's considered to be the center of iman, of understanding, of recognition, God consciousness, and spirituality. So Surah Yasin, it explains the fundamental beliefs of Islam in a very eloquent, beautiful, and emotive way allowing the message and meanings to penetrate our hearts. Um, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, اِقْرَأُوا Yasin عَلَى مَوْتَاكُمْ Recite Surah Yasin upon your dead. And what is meant by dead in this hadith is one who is about to leave this world. That if we know of someone who perhaps is terminally ill, and they're essentially on their deathbed, they're about to leave this world. It is recommended to recite Surah Yasin in their presence. And doing so will make the process of death easier upon them. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, 
There is no dying person upon whom Yasin is recited except that Allah makes death easy upon him. Death is a very, very difficult experience. The Prophet said, Death definitely has its difficulties. That moment when the angel of death is going to visit us and he's going to extract and pull our souls from our bodies, that's going to be a very difficult experience. And one of the ways of making that experience easier, of making the transition between this world and the next a little bit easier, is through the virtues, the blessings, the barakah of Surah Yasin. And one of the wisdoms is that when we recite Surah Yasin in the presence of someone who's about to leave this world, it will remind them about Allah. So as their soul is being pulled from their body, they are in a state of dhikr. They are in the state of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembering the last day. It serves as a catalyst for them to turn their attention towards Allah, to repent, seek forgiveness, and hope in His infinite mercy, grace, pardon, and forgiveness. And all of that will lead towards the process of death becoming easy upon a person. So this is something that is recommended. That if you go visit someone who's ill, they're terminally ill, they're on their deathbed, it is a recommended practice to recite Yasin in their presence. Some scholars, they understand this literally. And they say to actually recite it upon the deceased. That once they have already passed away. So even at the graveyard, at the time of the burial, when people are being put in the grave, you will find certain Muslim traditions and cultures reciting Surah Yasin. And that is derived from this particular hadith. Um, the Prophet ﷺ also said, uh, whoever's last words are La ilaha illallah. Man kana akhiru kanamihi la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah. Whoever's last words are La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. And one of the ways of ensuring that is by reciting Yasin in the presence of someone who's leaving this world. It will be a very powerful reminder for them to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And we ask Allah to give all of us the tawfiq and to give all of us an ending like that. Where the last words we say are, La ilaha illallah. In another narration, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, Whoever recites Yasin in the morning will be given ease for the day until the evening. And whoever recites it at the beginning of the evening will be given ease for the night until the morning. In another narration, it has been mentioned that whoever recites Yasin at night will remain happy until the morning, and whoever recites it in the morning will remain happy until the night. And then the narrator of this hadith says, it has something that's experienced. This is based off of personal experience. And that is why uh, in a lot of madaris throughout the world, it's a practice that the first thing the students do is recite Yasin in the morning. You know, the madrasa where I memorize the Quran, uh, Jamia Binuria in Pakistan, uh, after Salatul Fajr, we were not allowed to leave the masjid and go back to our dorms until you recited Surah Yasin. They would literally have like, you know, I, I don't know what you call them, but like teacher standing at the door and they would not let you leave until you recited Yasin. And that was a very, very healthy practice to instill within students. And the reason behind that is this particular narration. That whoever recites it in the morning, they will experience ease throughout the next rest of the day. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to experience difficulties and hardships and trials and tribulations and heartbreak. You'll still experience all of those things, but it will be made easy for you. That you will have the emotional strength to navigate through those challenges, through those difficulties. It creates a sense of like being content with Allah's decree and being uh, content with Allah's decision. Um, so scholars throughout the world, they encourage reciting Yasin in the morning. They describe a feeling of ease, happiness, and comfort as a result of this regular practice. And there's some other narrations that also speak about the virtues, the rewards, and blessings associated with Surah Yasin. Now, Many of these ahadith, they are technically classified as being weak. A lot of these narrations that speak about the virtues of Yasin, they are cl uh, classified as being da'if, and some of them might even be extremely da'if, 
But according to the majority of scholars, it is permissible to act upon weak ahadith in the hope of receiving some of these blessings, rewards, and virtues. You know, as Muslims, we are supposed to develop a culture of Qur'an. And part of that Qur'anic culture is that we have a daily routine with the Qur'an. That there should be a portion of the day that's dedicated to Qur'anic recitation. And in addition to that, there are certain surahs that we are encouraged to recite on a regular, consistent basis. Either daily or weekly. So in terms of daily recitation, it's a good practice, it's a good tradition. It should become part of our culture that we recite Surah Yasin in the morning. That we do that personally, we pass that practice on to our children. That we recite, you know, Surah Al Ikhlas and Surah Al Falaq and Surah Al Nas in the morning, in the evening, after every single prayer. That we recite Ayatul Kursi after every single prayer. That in the evening, sometime after Maghrib, we recite Surah Al Mulk and Surah Al Waqi'ah. That should just be part of our daily lives. That should become an adah. It should become a habit. Something that we are accustomed to. And that becomes part of our culture within our homes. And that culture gets passed on to our children as well. So Surah Yasin, inshallah, should be part of our daily routine. It's something that all of us, inshallah, should try to memorize. And most importantly, understand. Because the purpose of reciting these suah is not simply for the barakah, it's not simply for the blessings. Rather, the reason is to focus on the meanings so that we can implement the guidance into our daily lives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He opens the surah in a very beautiful and a very eloquent and powerful way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the surah with two simple letters, Yasin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening this very powerful, this very emotive chapter with two letters from the Arabic language that are recited separately. Yasin. And there are several sayings or explanations regarding what these two letters actually mean. So for example, some of the Mufassirun mention that these two letters are actually one of the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Yasin. Ismun min asma illahi ta'ala. It is one of the divine names of Allah, but nobody knows what it actually means. Others have said it's one of the names or titles given to our beloved Prophet. Ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhum and others mention that it means O human, it means Ya insan. Others have said it means O leader of mankind, or that it's the title of the surah itself. So when you look towards classical works of tafsir, you are going to come across all of these various explanations. And out of all of these various explanations, the most correct position is that these letters are from what is known as al-huruful muqatta'a, the broken letters, the separated letters. There are 29 chapters in the Quran, 29 surah in the Quran, that start with a series of separated letters, right? They're letters that are stringed together, but they're each pronounced individually, such as alif lam mim, alif lam ra, kaf ha ya ain sad, right? Ha mim ya sin. They are known as al huruful muqatta'a. They are known as the broken letters, the separated letters, and only Allah knows what they truly mean. And the reason for opening a surah with these letters is لِتَنْبِيهِ عَلَىٰ إِعْجَازِ الْقُرْآنِ To bring attention, to draw attention to the miraculous, inimitable nature of the Qur'an. So these are considered to be سِرٌ مِنْ أَسْرَارِ That these letters are a secret from the secrets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one knows what they truly mean except for Allah and Allah alone. They are from among the mutashabihat. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah that the verses of the Qur'an can be classified into two broad categories. Ayatun muhkamat. There are those verses whose meanings are absolutely clear. They are explicit. Every single human being has the ability to understand them. Hunna ummul kitab. And they are the core of the Qur'an. 
And they are the majority of the Qur'an. وَأُخَرُ متشابهات. The second category are those verses that are known as المتشابهات. Those verses and words whose meanings are unclear. They are ambiguous. That we as human beings don't know what they really mean. That the definitive meanings of these words and verses are unknown and they are used to highlight our limited knowledge in comparison to the infinite and limitless knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reminding us that He is an alim That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-knowing whose knowledge is infinite and limitless. Whereas we as human beings, although we have knowledge, it is very finite. It is limited. It is nothing compared to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, however, uh, we will come across some narrations from companions who try to explain what these letters mean. So for example, some of them say, each of these letters is an acronym. That the letter represents one of the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some say, uh, these are the letters of Allah's name spread throughout the Qur'an. So one of the examples they give is you have Alif, Lam, Ra, Ha, Mim, and Noon. Right? Alif, Lam, Ra like at the beginning of Surah Ibrahim. Ha, Mim like at the beginning of Surah Al-Ahqaf. Noon like the beginning of Surah Al-Qalam. And when you put all of them together, it makes the word Ar-Rahman. Right? That's just one plausible explanation that's given as well. But none of these narrations are definitive. They are simply attempts by the companions and their students to highlight some possible meanings. And the reason they went through this exercise is to show that the meanings of the Qur'an are endless. And they are timeless. That the Qur'an is an ocean that has no shore. That's a very famous statement from the scholars. They say, Al-Qur'an, Bahrun la sahila lahu. That the Qur'an is like an ocean that has no shore. You can continue to dive deeper and deeper into its meanings. So they're simply offering possibilities. Nobody knows what these letters actually mean. Now naturally, a question should come to our minds. That if no one knows what these letters mean, then why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention them in the Qur'an? That the main purpose of the Qur'an is guidance. The main purpose of the Qur'an is hidayah. So why would Allah mention letters and words that nobody knows what they mean? So the scholars, they mention possible reasons. So for example, they say, these letters are mentioned at the beginning of surahs to capture the attention of the audience. That one of the responsibilities of the Prophet ﷺ was to go out and recite the Qur'an to his community. As a prophet, as a messenger, that was one of his responsibilities. That when he would receive wahi, when he would receive the Qur'an, he was told to go and recite it to the community. So by opening his recitation with these letters that the Arabs were familiar with, but using them in a style, in a manner that was unknown, it would capture people's attention. It would grab the attention of the audience. You know, if I were to come up here and just say ABC, everyone's going to be looking at me like, what the heck is this guy talking about? Are you going to be paying attention? So similarly, the Prophet ﷺ, these letters, these huruful muqatta'a were revealed to serve as a tool of capturing the attention of the audience. Another possibility is to remind us that no matter how much we know, there's always something that we do not know. To create this level of intellectual humility within ourselves. That despite all of our advancements in terms of technology and medicine and all of these discoveries and research and you know inventions, our knowledge as human beings is very, very limited. Our knowledge is nothing compared to the infinite and limitless knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by mentioning these letters, we are reminded to be humble. That, oh human being, you do not know. Wallahu ya'lam wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you don't. So when you come towards the Qur'an, come to the Qur'an with humility. In order to learn, in order to seek knowledge, in order to seek guidance. Another explanation is that these letters, they are obviously letters from the Arabic language. And the Qur'an was revealed at a time 
that the culture of that community revolved around language. Right? The Arabs of that time, they took a lot of pride in their ability to use the language in a very eloquent and beautiful and powerful way. Whether that was composing prose or poetry. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending something down as a challenge to them intellectually and spiritually. That you think your use of the Arabic language is so amazing and so eloquent and so beautiful. Look at this. That these are letters you're familiar with. You, you've heard them before, but you've never heard them being used in such a unique and distinct way. So, لِلْتَنْبِيهِ عَلَىٰ إِعْجَازِ الْقُرْآنِ You know, one of, the, um, one of the aspects that makes the Qur'an miraculous is that it is inimitable. No human being has the ability to produce anything similar to it in any way, shape, or form. Especially in terms of its eloquence, its beauty, its power, its effectiveness and emotiveness. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the surahs with these letters, it's a reminder of the miraculous and inimitable nature of the Qur'an. So Yasin, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens with Yasin grabbing our attention and reminding us of the miraculous, inimitable nature of the Qur'an. والقرآن الحكيم By the wise Qur'an إنك لمن المرسلين You are truly one of the messengers على صراط مستقيم Upon a straight path تنزيل العزيز الرحيم This is a revelation from the Almighty, the Most Merciful Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He opens the second verse by taking an oath by the Qur'an. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is taking an oath. He's swearing by His own speech. And generally, someone swears by something or takes an oath to highlight the importance of what they're saying and to prove that it's true. You know, even in common conversation and speech, we say, I swear by Allah, wallahi, when we want to emphasize a point or when we want to prove that we're speaking the truth. So similarly in the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath, it is being done to emphasize something or to prove that something is the absolute undeniable truth. And oaths, they are common throughout the Qur'an. They are used to emphasize certain undeniable truths and realities. And generally speaking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by one of his own magnificent and amazing creations that proves his existence, oneness, and limitless power. So sometimes he might take an oath by something he has declared to be sacred. Sometimes he will take an oath by one of his amazing creations. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath, it should cause us to pause and reflect. That our Lord, our Creator, the Lord of the worlds, whose speech is the truth, is taking an oath. And here Allah, He's swearing by the Qur'an. وَالْقُرْآنِ hakim By the Qur'an rich in wisdom. Or by the wise Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's swearing by His own divine revealed speech to prove and emphasize that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is definitely a messenger. That's the purpose. The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the Qur'an is to emphasize and highlight that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is definitely a messenger. There's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself swears by the Qur'an to declare this reality, it highlights the rank, the status and honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an with the word Al-Hakim. He describes it using the adjective Al-Hakim, which means wise. And the word Hakim, it comes from the Arabic root letters Ha, Kaf, and Mim. And these root letters, they convey the meanings of wisdom, judgment, rule, and decision. The word Hakim as an adjective, it can have two meanings. It can mean wisdom, it can also mean perfection. And both of these meanings can be understood here. وَالْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ By the wise Qur'an, 
or you can say by the perfect Qur'an. And the Qur'an, as we mentioned, is full of deep divine wisdom. Because it is the speech of Al-Hakim, it contains wisdom that is beyond any human conception or understanding of wisdom. The wisdom of the Qur'an provides guidance for every single aspect of our lives. So every single chapter, verse, word, concept, idea, theme, story, lesson, reminder, rule, instruction, parable, command, and prohibition is from the infinite, limitless, and comprehensive wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the words of Al-Hakim, the infinitely most wise. The Qur'an is similar to a, a wise sage or an elder that we come to for guidance and direction in our daily lives. You know, for those of you who have elder family members, uh, perhaps your grandparents or your great-grandparents, oftentimes we go to them for advice because they have so much experience in life. And that life experience gives them wisdom. So similarly, the Qur'an is like a wise sage. It's full of this amazing wisdom that if we as human beings need guidance for anything in life, we can always approach the Qur'an. And we will definitely find something there that will help us navigate through whatever challenge we're facing as human beings. Um, one of the Mufassirun, they wrote that wisdom is a quality of rational beings. Right? Wisdom is a quality of rational beings. But here, it's being used to describe the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attributing a quality of life to His revelation, suggesting that it has a soul of its own, giving it qualities similar to those of a living person. Whenever we open our hearts to the Qur'an, it will reveal more of its wisdom to us. So the Qur'an is Al-Hakim. The Qur'an is full of deep divine wisdom. Another meaning is perfect. Qur'an al-Hakim by the perfect Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the Qur'an as being perfect and harmonious in terms of its words and meanings that the Qur'an is composed, organized and structured in the most perfect way possible and it's absolutely free of any faults, discrepancies and contradictions. There are no contradictions in terms of words and meanings. It's free from all kinds of excess and deficiencies and it is totally balanced and harmonious. The Qur'an is perfect because it's coming from the source of perfection, Allah. So a better way of translating what Qur'an in Hakim is by the wise, perfect Qur'an. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Seen, wal Qur'an in Hakim, by the wise, perfect Qur'an, innaka lamin al mursaleen. You are definitely a messenger. So immediately after taking an oath by the wise and perfect Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the subject of the oath, the reason why he's swearing by the Qur'an. إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ You are truly one of the messengers عَلَىٰ صِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Upon a straight path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the wise and perfect Qur'an and telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he is definitely a messenger without a doubt upon the truth. And this is being addressed directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِنَّكَ Truly you, لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Are one of the messengers عَلَى صِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Upon a straight path. And that straight path is the path of Islam. The path that leads towards success in this world and salvation in the next. The straight path is referring to the entire deen of Islam. This comprehensive, holistic, total, complete way of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for humanity. And the path of Islam is mustaqim. It is straight, upright, direct, clear, and unambiguous, leading directly towards Allah. Leading directly towards salvation. And through this oath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He's actually consoling and comforting the Prophet ﷺ. And at the same time, he's refuting the false and baseless accusations of the Quraysh. So that is why the Mufassirun say that this verse, it serves two very important purposes. Number one, تَسْلِيَةٌ لِلنَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, That Allah the Most High, 
He is consoling and comforting the Prophet ﷺ, reminding him uh, to be patient, to be steadfast, to persevere. Because obviously he was facing opposition. He was facing rejection, mockery, ridicule, harassment, sarcasm. So in that context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, don't pay attention to what anyone's saying. إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ You are definitely a messenger. You have definitely received revelation. عَلَى سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And you are definitely on the straight path. And it's an emphatic rejection of the false claims of Quraysh. That what they're saying about you, O Prophet, is not true. It has no basis at all. So those would be like the twin objectives of this verse. إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ عَلَى سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Objective number one, to console, to comfort, reassure the Prophet ﷺ. Number two, to reject all of the false and baseless claims of the people of Quraysh. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells the Prophet ﷺ, one of the reasons why he has been sent as a Prophet and Messenger, sorry, Tanzeel al-Aziz al-Rahim. Right? This is a revelation from the Almighty, the Most Merciful. Now Tanzeel in the Arabic language, uh, this is known as a mustar. Uh, how many of you have done Arabic here at Miftah? We don't have any of like the seekers? Okay, mashallah. Khair. Quick Arabic lesson. <laughs> there's, there's a type of word in Arabic known as a mustar. It's a verbal noun. It's a noun that's derived from a verb. And the verb here is nazzala yunazzilu. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses two verbs to describe revelation. They come from the same root letters, but they're on different patterns. So one of them is nazzala, and the other is anzala. Nazzala, the verbal noun is tanzil. That is referring to the Qur'an being revealed gradually over a period of 23 years. Anzala inzal is referring to the Qur'an being revealed all at once. So when it comes to the history of revelation, the Qur'an was revealed twice. The first revelation is from Al-Lawhul Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, to the lower heavens of this world. And then from there, it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ gradually over a period of 23 years. So, Tanzeel Al-Aziz Al-Rahim. This is a gradual revelation from Al-Aziz, the Almighty, Al-Rahim, the Most Wise. And we already discussed Al-Aziz, right? The Almighty, the All-Powerful. And Ar-Rahim, the absolutely most wise. So these, these words of the Qur'an, they are the words of Al-Aziz and Ar-Rahim. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He then tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi one of the reasons why he's been sent as a prophet and messenger. So that you may warn a people whose forefathers were not warned, and because of that they are heedless. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi that He has sent him with the Qur'an, the wise and perfect scripture from the Almighty, the Most Merciful, so that He may warn a people, so that He may warn a community whose forefathers were not warned. And the forefathers who were not warned is referring to the Arabs of that time. Right? This is referring to the Arabs of that time particularly the mushrikun of Mecca. Because since the time of Ibrahim السلام, no prophet or messenger, no scripture had been sent to them for several centuries. And because no warner had come to them, no messenger had come to them, they were unaware of the truth, they were unaware of belief, of guidance, morality, and divine law. They were in a state of ghafla. فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ they are in a state of heedlessness. So they were unaware of true belief and they were drowning in the darkness of idol worship and immorality. Ghafla is one of the worst afflictions of the heart. One of the worst things that can afflict the heart, one of the most destructive diseases is ghafla. That you are totally heedless to ultimate truths and realities. You are clueless about guidance. Um, a heedless heart is unable to see, process, or understand the truth. That the truth may be right in front of your eyes, as clear as the sun, 
but you're unable to see it, let alone notice it or feel it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he's being reminded that one of your main responsibilities is to warn your community, to snap them out of their state of ghafna. That one of the primary objectives of revelation is to warn against disbelief, to warn against immorality, heedlessness, carelessness, and everlasting punishment. The Prophet ﷺ was sent both as a giver of glad tidings and a warner. Bashiran wa nadira. These were two functions, these were two roles of the Prophet ﷺ. He was a Bashir. He would give people good news, glad tidings. That give good news of blessings, mercy, grace, forgiveness, salvation, and paradise to those who have accepted the truth and believed. And he was a nadir, a warner. Someone who's warning with genuine care, with genuine concern, with sincerity, that the Prophet ﷺ warned those who rejected the truth and disbelieved about punishment both in this world and the next. So, لِتُنْذِرَ قَوْمًا That, O Prophet ﷺ, you have been given this revelation from the Almighty, the Most Merciful, to warn a people. مَا أُنْذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ Whose forefathers were not warned. فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ And as a result of that, they are in the state of heedlessness. And your warning is supposed to snap them out of it. Your warning is supposed to remind them about these ultimate truths, these ultimate realities. It's supposed to bring them back to belief in Allah alone without any partners. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that those people uh, he knew would choose disbelief and die upon it. That although the Prophet ﷺ is warning people, there will be some people who are not going to pay attention. There are going to be certain individuals that will not benefit from the warning. Why? لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ The word has indeed come true about most of them, so they will not believe. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ The word has indeed come true عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ about most of them, فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ So they will not believe. Now the word Al-Qawl in this verse, it refers to the divine decree. The divine judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that most of them will not believe. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew from pre-eternity that this group of individuals will not accept the truth. That your warning, O Prophet, will not benefit them in any way, shape, or form. They're going to reject the truth, and as a result of that, be deserving of punishment in the hereafter. Now, ala akhtarihim, most of them, is referring to the sworn and open enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly from the leadership of Quraysh, that opposed him at every single opportunity. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed, he had decreed from pre-eternity, that these individuals would not accept the truth and they would do so based on their own volition, on their own choice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His infinite knowledge and wisdom, He knew that these individuals through their own free will would choose disbelief and be persistent in it and they would deny the truth until their death. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ That they are not going to believe. Now this doesn't mean that they were compelled, they were coerced or forced to disbelief. Rather, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was aware of the fact that they would be stubborn and choose to disbelief even after they had been warned. That they chose not to believe and reject the Prophet's warning through their own individual free will. And this also serves to console and comfort the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's reminding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that your responsibility is simply to convey the message of guidance. You are not responsible for people choosing to accept it or deny it. And this is something that would really disturb the Prophet ﷺ. That he's given this responsibility by Allah. That your responsibility is to invite your community and all of humanity towards the truth, towards belief in Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ, would convey that message with the utmost sincerity, with the utmost concern for his people. He wasn't doing it for any worldly gain, for any ulterior motive. There was no material motivation behind it. 
His care for his people and humanity was absolutely genuine and sincere. So the Prophet والسلام, he's going to the people of Mecca and he's delivering this warning with sincerity, being genuine. He wants to save them. He wants to save as many people as possible from going and ending up in hellfire. But instead of listening to that warning, people rejected him and they opposed him. And then they started attacking him and harassing him with ridicule and mockery and opposition and rejection. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now comforting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that don't be concerned about that. You have fulfilled your responsibility properly and correctly. These people, they were never going to believe. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ That my divine decree has come true upon them, upon the majority of them, and they will not believe. So, O Prophet, don't be phased. Right? Do not be disturbed by that. Carry on with your message, carry on with your mission, and continue to persevere and be steadfast and be patient. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He now gives two examples um, or metaphors of the state of their disbelief. That at this point, the surah draws an image of their psychological condition. And these people that aren't going to believe, why is it? Why in the world aren't they accepting the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us two examples to highlight their condition, their state of disbelief. And we see them with chains around their necks, barriers separating from them from divine guidance, and with a cover over their eyes, depriving them of the ability to see. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ أَغْلَانَ فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ We have placed iron collars on their necks. So they are reaching up to their chins and their heads are forced to remain upwards. That's the first description. وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدَّا وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدَّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ and we have placed a barrier in front of them and a barrier behind them. And thus, they are encircled by us so they do not see. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, He is giving us a physical description that describes the spiritual bankruptcy of the non-believers of Quraysh. That you have these people that are seeing the Prophet ﷺ with their own two eyes. They are listening to his warning with their own two ears. Yet they still aren't accepting the truth. How is that possible? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's giving us insight into their mindset, into their condition, into their circumstances of why they continue to reject the truth. So He's providing a physical description that's describing their spiritual bankruptcy. Uh, this figure of description, it helps us understand their inability to see the truth even though it's right in front of their eyes. So, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ أَغْلَالًا Allah is telling us that He has placed an iron collar on their necks. An iron collar similar to those that were placed around the necks of dangerous criminals in the past. And if you've seen like these movies and TV shows that show like historical things and you, you see prisoners, they have these iron collars on their necks. Right? It's like a collar literally made out of iron. It fills the entire space of the neck. And generally, there's like a chain that binds and shackles the hands of the criminals to their necks as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is illustrating the picture of a prisoner bound and shackled with a collar and chains. And this iron collar, it reaches their chin. Right? It's so high that it reaches their chin, forcing their head and eyes upward. فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ right? The iron collar goes to their chins. فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ So their heads are forced upward. So they're unable to see what's right in front of them. Again, this is a figurative description of their spiritual reality. That despite the clarity of the truth that can be seen with open eyes, these individuals have failed to see it. As if their heads and eyes are forced upwards by the collars around their necks. And this figurative description can be understood as a metaphor for their pride and arrogance. That one of the main reasons why the kuffar of Mecca, why the Quraysh of Mecca initially refused to accept Islam is because of their pride, because of their arrogance. 
deep down inside of their hearts, they knew the truth. They knew without a shadow of a doubt that the Prophet ﷺ was telling the truth. That he's definitely a prophet and messenger. But because of their arrogance, because of their pride, because of their spiritual bankruptcy, they refused to accept it. They refused to see it. They were too pride, so their heads are held up high. Another understanding is that they were so engrossed in ghafla. They were so engrossed in material things that they were shackled by it. And they were unable to break free from the shackles of this world. And that is one of the beautiful things of Islam. That when a person enters into the fold of Islam, when they surrender and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they break free from the shackles of this dunya. They break free from the shackles of all material things and they are able to connect their hearts to Allah. You know, in Islam, real true freedom, it comes by becoming a slave of Allah. Right? Actual real freedom in Islam, it is attained by surrendering ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These individuals were unable to do so because they had surrendered themselves to the dunya. That's how it's being explained. Inna ja'alna fi a'naqihim aghlala. That we have placed these iron collars on their necks. Fahiya ila al-athqan. And they reach up to their chins. Fahum muqmahun. So their heads and eyes are faced or forced upwards. In the second description, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He has placed a barrier in front of them and a barrier behind them. Fahum la yubsirun. And because of that, they are unable to see. فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ We surrounded them with these barriers. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ And because of that, they cannot see. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed some sort of barrier that surrounds them and restricts their sight, vision, and movement. And this barrier cuts them off from their surroundings, causing them to be unaware of what's going on around them. And this is a figurative expression for them having surrounded themselves with ignorance and stubbornness. And this ignorance, this stubbornness, it prevents them from accepting the truth. That all of the pathways of Iman entering into their hearts have been blocked and sealed off. And as a result of these barriers again, their entire life is encircled by disbelief and they cannot see the truth. And amazingly, uh, we meet and interact with people that fit into both of these descriptions. Even in the modern era, that we are going to come across individuals Deep down inside of their hearts, they know there has to be a God. Deep down inside of their hearts, they know that the message of Islam is true. But they're too proud to accept it. They have too much pride, they have too much arrogance, and they will refuse to accept the truth. And their ego prevents them from doing so. And that's actually one of the definitions of pride that was given by the Prophet ﷺ. That kibbun, uh, arrogance and pride, is to belittle others and reject the truth. We also come across people that all of the signs of the truth are around them. They are constantly surrounded with signs that prove the existence of Allah. But for some reason, they're unable to see it. They have set up these false barriers in front of them and behind them. They're surrounded by these barriers. And because of that, they have been spiritually blinded. And they're unable to see the truth that is all around them. You know, for example, there are individuals who have dedicated their lives to science. And they spend countless hours observing and researching some of the most amazing creations of Allah. Yet they still don't believe in the divine. You know, that's mind-boggling. That makes absolutely no sense to us. That a person whose entire life is spent studying some of the most amazing creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet they fail to see Allah behind it. They fail to see that truth. They fail to see that reality. So that comes from them being spiritually blind. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing here. وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدَّةً وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدَّةً فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ That we have placed a barrier in front of them. That barrier could be their own deeds. Again, it could be their arrogance, their pride, their ignorance, their stubbornness, whatever factor it may be. They have put a barrier behind them. فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ So now they're surrounded. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ And because of that, they are unable to see the truth. And because of that, when the Prophet ﷺ warns these people, 
It has no effect upon them. وَسَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ It is the same whether you warn them or not, they will never believe. Right? It doesn't matter, O Prophet wasallam. if you warn them or you don't warn them, these individuals are not going to believe. And again, through this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is consoling, comforting, and reassuring the Prophet wasallam. And that's actually something very beautiful about the Qur'an. That when you read the Qur'an, you see this very beautiful interaction between Allah and the Prophet That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through several verses, He's actually consoling and reassuring and comforting the Prophet As I mentioned, the Prophet he had this genuine concern for the safety, protection, and salvation of his people because his mission was to save as many people as possible from eternal punishment through the light of faith and guidance. And when people would reject the truth, it would cause pain to the Prophet ﷺ. And the pain he felt was not personal. He didn't take it personally. It was a result of his knowledge regarding what that rejection leads to. He knew that if these people don't accept the truth, then they are going to experience eternal, everlasting punishment in the life of the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's reminding the Prophet wasallam that because the non-believers of Quraysh are spiritually deaf, dumb, and blind, it is the same whether you warn them or not. They will never believe. They will never believe because of the barriers that are preventing Iman from entering their hearts. Your warning and reminding will not benefit them in any way, as long as they're unwilling and unable to accept the truth. And they have been so blinded by their beliefs, and they are so arrogant and proud, that no matter what you say or do, it will not affect them, because warning does not give life to a heart, rather it only alerts a heart that is alive and ready to receive guidance. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, to console and comfort the Prophet ﷺ by reminding him that his warning only affects those who believe in the Qur'an and fear him. So yes, your warning is not going to benefit these people, but there are other individuals, there are other members of your community, there are other members of humanity that definitely benefit from the warning. إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ you can only warn those who follow the reminder and are in awe of the Most Merciful without having seen Him. So give them good news of forgiveness and an honorable reward. This is a very, very beautiful verse. Right? You can only warn those who follow the reminder and are in awe of the most compassionate bil ghayb without having seen him fabashiruhu bi maghfiratin wa ajrin karim so give them good news of forgiveness and an honorable reward so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's telling the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that your warning benefits and affects individuals who possess two unique qualities and characteristics number 1 ittiba'u dhikr those who follow the reminder and number two, the people of Khashya. Those who are in awe of the most compassionate without seeing him. Now, man ittaba'a dhikr. Right? Those who follow the reminder. A dhikr, the reminder, this is one of the titles, this is one of the names of the Qur'an. It's been called the reminder because it reminds the audience of the existence, oneness, might, power, and glory of Allah. It reminds humanity about fundamental concepts, responsibilities, values, principles, morals, and ethics. Whenever we recite the Qur'an, we are reminded about Allah. We are reminded about our relationship with Him, that He is our Lord and we are His slaves and servants. We are reminded about His rights upon us and our rights upon each other. We're reminded about manners, etiquettes, character, virtues, Worship, submission, servitude, the purpose of life, morality, right and wrong, the finite nature of this life, the eternal nature of the life to come, resurrection, life after death, accountability, judgment, reward and punishment, paradise and hell, 
The Qur'an is the ultimate reminder. That's one of the reasons why it's called a dhikr Following the reminder, it refers to first and foremost, accepting and acknowledging that it is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his last and final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, believing in it, reciting it, understanding it, reflecting upon its meanings, and implementing its guidance into our daily lives. So ittiba'u dhikr following the reminder, it has layers to it. The first layer is having belief that this is the divine speech of Allah. These are the words again of Al-Alim, Al-Hakim, Al-Aziz, Al-Rahim. Number two is then reciting it. Part of following the reminder is reciting the reminder. Number three, the third layer is then understanding it. The fourth layer is reflecting on its meanings. And the fifth layer is implementing its meanings, its guidance into our daily lives. All of that is ittiba'u dhikr So, إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنْ اِتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ That your warning will only benefit those who follow the reminder. وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ And who fear الرَّحْمَانَ Without ever having seen him. And it's ittiba'u dhikr It's following the Qur'an with all of its layers that leads towards khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, following the Qur'an as described with all of these layers, it nurtures and develops khashya, which is positive fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the second quality of those who truly benefit from the warning and guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You know, khashya, it's a particular type of fear that comes from reverence, awe, respect, and love. That we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of our, our love, our reverence and respect of Him. It is this fear that helps keeps us firm and steadfast upon the straight path. And the word choice is very unique. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to refer to Himself with the name Ar-Rahman. The most merciful, the most compassionate. And this reminds us that although we do fear the anger and displeasure of Allah and His punishment, he is also the most compassionate. Right? When we think about Ar-Rahman, the first thing that doesn't come to mind is fear. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's pairing these two ideas together. That yes, we do fear Allah. That's part and parcel of our Iman. That's one of the ways in which we express love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that fear is always balanced with hope. And that hope comes from the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman. He is the absolutely most merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one whose mercy is infinite. It encompasses all things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this mercy, He forgives all sins, mistakes, shortcomings, acts of disobedience. As long as we turn back to Him through seeking forgiveness and repentance. And our relationship with Allah is guided through fear and hope. So we fear his punishment, his anger, his displeasure. We fear standing before him on the day of judgment. But we balance that with hope in his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. And it's this delicate balance between hope and fear that is the essence and reality of iman. And that's why the scholars, they would say, an iman bain al-khawfi wa raja The real, true, sincere faith, it lies somewhere in between hope and fear. Hope in Allah's mercy and fear of His punishment. Bil ghayb. And the unique thing about this fear is that we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we love Him, we have hope in Him without ever having seen Him. That belief in the unseen al ghayb is a fundamental aspect of our iman. That although we have never seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we still have absolute certainty in His existence oneness, might, and power. We have absolute certainty that He alone created the universe and everything it contains, that He is absolutely unique, and that He alone is deserving and worthy of worship. Although we have never seen Allah, there are manifest signs of His existence all around us. The entire world, the entire universe is a proof of the existence of Allah. So although we've never seen Him, we believe in Him. And one of the reasons why we believe in Him is because this entire world, 
The entire world is full of signs that are pointing towards his direction. So, إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْمِ فَبَشِّرُهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Whoever follows the Qur'an, whoever has fear of Ar-Rahman, then give them the good news, give them the glad tidings of Maghfirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of their sins. He will forgive their mistakes, their shortcomings, their poor decisions, their sins and acts of disobedience. وَأَجْرٍ Karim, And He will give them a noble reward. And that noble reward is Jannah. That noble reward is paradise. So through this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a very, very simple roadmap that leads towards forgiveness and salvation in the life of the hereafter. Living our lives according to the guidance of the Qur'an and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as we do these two things, فَبَشِّرُهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Then give people good news. Give them the glad tidings. Let them rejoice in forgiveness from Allah and a noble, honorable reward, which is paradise. All right. Now, a major theme uh, of these opening verses of Surah Yasin has been prophethood. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the Qur'an or opens the Surah by taking an oath by the Qur'an to highlight that the Prophet sallallahu is definitely a messenger. That he mentions some of his objectives as a prophet. That your responsibility, your role is to warn people. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reminds us now about life after death. So as I mentioned, most Meccan revelation, it's revolving around three concepts. Tawheed, Ar-Risala, and Al-Qiyamah. So, so far Surah Yasin has spoken about Ar-Risala. It's spoken about prophethood. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about Al-Qiyamah or life after death. He reminds us that every single one of us will be brought back to life and we are going to be held accountable for our deeds and we are reminded that everything we say, everything we do is being recorded. It is certainly we who resurrect the dead and write what they send forth and what they leave behind. Everything is listed by us in a perfect record. So in the first part of this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is establishing that life after death is an absolute truth and reality. This is a statement that's full of emphasis. Indeed, certainly, truly, we resurrect the dead. We bring the dead back to life on the day of judgment. In the second part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the concepts of accountability, reward, and punishment. That we are recording and writing what they send forth and what they leave behind. And we have everything listed in a perfect record. So, without a doubt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring us back to life on the day of judgment to hold us accountable for our deeds. And one of the reasons for mentioning this with such emphasis is because this is one of the most difficult things the Quraysh found with the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That how can you claim that once we are dead, once we are buried, and our bodies have decomposed and turned into dirt and dust, how is it possible that we're going to be brought back to life? This is something unimaginable, it's far-fetched, it's impossible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself responds with emphasis. Without a doubt, we are going to bring the dead back to life. And one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights this is because of accountability. Resurrection exists for the day of judgment. So that every single human can stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be held accountable for whatever they've done and whatever they've said. Right? That's why Allah says, وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُ وَأَثَرًا We are recording, we are writing what they send forth and what they leave behind. This is a very important thing for all of us to understand. This is what develops khashiyah. 
This is what develops taqwa. That every single thing we say, every single thing we do as human beings, it's being recorded in our book of deeds. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed two angels with every single one of us. And their only responsibility is to record everything we say and do, both the good and the bad. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ the human being does not utter a single word except that there are two angels waiting to record it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He refers to our statements and deeds as what we send forward. Ma qaddamu, Because it's as if we're sending them forward for judgment and accountability. So our words and deeds, good and bad, righteous and shameful, will be for or against us on the day of judgment. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Infitar, then each soul will know what it has sent forth or left behind. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu attaqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad wa attaqullaha inna allaha khabirun bima ta'amanun. O believers, be mindful of Allah and let every soul look to what deeds it has sent forth for tomorrow. And fear Allah, for certainly Allah is all aware of what you do. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the consequences of our deeds in several um, ahadith. وَآثَارَهُمْ right, آثَارَهُمْ The traces. So, athar is the plural of the word athar, which is translated as trace, vestige, track, sign, or mark. And according to several scholars of tafsir, it refers to the outcome, the impact, the consequences of our deeds and statements, whether good or bad. And these consequences show up later on and they continue to have an influence. So basically, whatever good we do and whatever good we leave behind will bring us reward. And whatever evil we do and whatever evil we leave behind will bring us sin. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever introduces a good practice that is followed after him will have a reward for that and the equivalent of their reward without that detracting from the reward in the slightest. And whoever introduces an evil practice that is followed after him will bear the burden of sin for that and the equivalent of their burden of sin without that detracting from their burden in the slightest. And the Prophet ﷺ also told us that when the son of Adam dies, all of his deeds come to an end, uh, except for three, knowledge that is beneficial, a righteous child who prays for him, and ongoing charity that he leaves behind. So that's one of the understandings of atharum. It's referring to the consequences of our actions. That if we establish a good practice, if I do something good and I leave behind a positive legacy, and as a result, people start doing good as well, I will receive a portion of that reward. But the opposite is also true. If I establish something evil or harmful, if I create something destructive, I will get the sin for doing so, and then the consequences of that will also be on my shoulder. So, naktubu ma qaddamu, referring to our deeds, wa ahtharahum, and their consequences. Um, another example, or another interpretation, is that the word athar here is referring to the footsteps of those who walk towards the masjid for prayer. Right? Naktubu ma qaddamu is referring to general words and deeds. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something specific which is very beloved to him. And that is making our way to the masjid to pray in congregation. And this interpretation is based on a hadith that is cited as the background of revelation for this particular verse. Um, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anh narrates that Banu Salima, their homes were on the outskirts of Medina. And because their homes were a little bit far from the masjid, they wanted to move closer to the masjid. And then this verse was revealed. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, your steps are being recorded, so don't move. Right? He told Banu Salima, don't move. Stay far away, because every single step you take to come to the masjid is being recorded in your book of good deeds. Uh, in another version, Jabir radiallahu anh narrates that Banu Salima decided to move near the masjid because there were some vacant plots near it. 
When this news reached the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, he said, O oh, Banu Salima, remain in your homes because your footsteps are recorded. And after hearing this, Banu Salima said, moving closer would not have made us happy. And there's several narrations from the Prophet وسلم, that mention the virtues, the rewards, and blessings for walking to the masjid. And because time is short, uh, I will skip over them. But just know that one of the most virtuous things we can do is make our way to the masjid for daily prayer. Uh, and alhamdulillah, I, I don't know about the culture here in, in Detroit, but in SoCal, it's a struggle for people. Our, our masajid, mashallah, are not as populated as they are here. Uh, I'm sure there's several factors and reasons for that. But as committed believers, the masjid has to be part of our daily routine. It has to be part of our daily lives. That we have to make it to the masjid at least, at least once a day. Ideally more than that, but at least once a day we should make it to the masjid to pray in jama'ah. And there are so many ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ that speak about the virtues, the rewards, the blessings associated with doing so. You know, every step you take to the masjid, one sin is being erased. Every step you take to the masjid, your rank and, uh, and status is being elevated by one decree. وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مبين. Everything is listed by us in a perfect record. So every single thing we say, every single thing we do is recorded in our book of deeds. And that book is going to be presented to us. It's going to be given to us on the day of judgment. The righteous will receive it in the right hand and the wicked will receive it in their left hand. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of us among those who receive their book in the right hands. Insha'Allah. Um, let's take a short break, insha'Allah. All right, short. I'm going to say a five minute break because time is short again. I have about, I think, 30 more minutes to get through a lot of verses, insha'Allah. <laughs>